talking about uh, leadership and um, and courts, well, the Supreme Court, which is the highest of all courts, apparently. No, is there is there one higher than that, Dr. Rod? No, no not in the United it. States, the no. Supreme Court. The High Court and then the Supreme Court, is it? I don't know. Like there's a... What's the difference the Supreme, between a high court and a Supreme Court? Oh, there are di- different levels of courts, but you can't in the United States. Once you've been to the Supreme Court, you've exhausted all avenues for any kind of appeal. So, there, I'm really interested to talk to you, Doctor Rod, about this about Harvard and their affirmative action admissions uh, process and their fight that's been going on for like almost ten years or something like that. Yourself, you've been in administration in universities, uh, you've been a CEO of a higher education institution, you've been vice principal, like, like you've, you've covered the gamut of, uh, of the higher education, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, academia world. Harvard now have been told, you know, that that they can't hire based on race. And their um, their principal, or hold on, let me uh, forget who it was. Um, don't know. The, uh, President-elect Claudine Gay, that's who it is, um, responded and she went on about and, and was just talking about, well, even though the Supreme Court says that we can't hire against your hire for race, we're still going to do it. Yeah, I, I, reading between the lines, it pretty much just just said that, which I thought was was pretty interesting. So they've been on this battle for a while. Obviously, there's been a lot of affirmative action and everything like that. I'm really interested to take and and. I want to just say it from the outset that we are two straight white males now going to be talking about affirmative action and and um, and uh, and things like that. So I just want to say that, but we we have wisdom and uh, we have discernment, and so, Doctor Rob, this affirmative the affirmative administration stuff. First of all, as a as a academia, as an academic, um, that's been in administration in in universities. You were dean of students at a university. I have been, that yes, I have your, been. Your yes. role. Yeah. What's your take on this affirmative admissions process? Well, look, there is a place for affirmative action. I'd have to say that based on experience. Um, you know, look, the whole debate, of course, has become very strongly focused on race in the United States and critical race theory, of course, has brought to the fore the idea that there's widespread institutional um, barriers to people who are not uh, white and often male. Look, as an outside observer, I would have to say I, I can't get excited about critical race theory. It mm-hmm. might have explained some things in history but it certainly really isn't descriptive of the way the United States or any other Western nation is at the moment. So I just put that on the table. I don't accept critical race theory because I think it takes us in the wrong direction altogether. However, if you go back, um, say, 20, 25 years in terms of the history of affirmative action, in terms of admission of students, this is about admission of students, not, not hiring, but it's about admission of students into courses at university level. Initially, affirmative action was not really any kind of recognition or outcome of racism. It was recognised that there were some people who had a disadvantaged background because the research showed, for example, that it was generally people with who came from higher income backgrounds who succeeded in admission and therefore in graduation from university. And so they got the jobs that required university degrees. And it just perpetuated now, the problem. My, my reading of the history, my understanding of the history and having been involved myself in administering affirmative action of various kinds in relation to students, is that race, or in some cases coming from a rural area, 
was really used as a shorthand way of dealing with a whole range of factors that led to some kind of disadvantage. Poverty, uh, living in a remote area, a lack of access to high quality education um, during the schooling years, a whole range of factors, broken families, all of these things impinged upon a young person's performance, their academic performance during their school years. And of course, when entry into university is determined only on the basis of academic results, some people who would otherwise perform well but have disadvantage don't get an opportunity to demonstrate their capacity to perform well. Now, I'm a great believer in the value of outputs rather than inputs. Mm -hmm. And therefore, where, where there is evidence that people who uh, have missed out in some way I think that there needs to be an alternative way for them in university. And here in Australia, we usually actually call it university um, yeah. entry requirement, sorry, not university, alternative entry requirements. And I've written lots and lots of um, statements about degrees. I've done lots and lots of submission on new degrees in my in my career. And we always specify alternative entry requirements. Most of the universities here in Australia have um, special pathways for people who have disadvantage. I think what's happened in more recent years is that um, using, using race as an indicator has kind of lost its focus and the focus has come back to be purely on race. Now, in terms of the Supreme Court's uh, decision, I know it's come under a lot of criticism. The president was very critical in a dangerous way, I think, because I think what he said undermines the authority of the court. The decision wasn't unanimous. It was a split decision in both cases in respect of Harvard and I think the other university was North Carolina. Um, so it was a split decision. Not all of the, the judges agreed, but the, the, the judgment was about the Constitution, and that is what the Supreme Court should be um, yeah. uh, should should be focusing on. Um, I, I think some of the reactions have been quite unhelpful on both the right and the left because I think they misunderstand the whole purpose for affirmative action in the first place. It wasn't really a response to racism; it was it was a response to disadvantage, and race was used, if you like, as a shorthand way of um, indicating yeah. disadvantage. It's probably, look, I would say now we need to be a lot more sophisticated. And, and one of the things that, that has been asserted is that race-based affirmative action has actually left other, or left uh, racial minorities out of the system altogether. So I, I think it's probably time the universities use far more sophisticated uh, methods for uh, admission into entry. But look, I, I'd really think for the good of the nation, I'm talking here about their economic good, we need to focus on the quality of the output, not the quality of the input. Um, personally, I, I'm very keen on the idea of open entry into universities, which means anybody can go. Yeah. Uh, they won't all get into the university of their first choice, of course. But I, I think open entry is quite a good idea, but with a fairly rigorous weeding out along the way so that we're saying, well, okay, here's your opportunity, but you've got to perform well, say by about a third to halfway through your degree. Yeah, so so that's because the, it's all well and good to give someone your access, but they still need to be able to perform. Because the thing is, is the way that I see it is, look, I I didn't do well at school. Uh, sorry. I actually did reasonably well at school. Um, however, I had a lot of learning disabilities, which challenged me, but I still did reasonably well. I actually got into university because I was a mature age student and I sat a special test and that test suited my 
ability mm-hmm. and I got a really high score in that rather than all of the other class stuff and everything like that. So mm-hmm. I suppose I got a special admission in into university. I, I, I would say that. I suffered at university because I wasn't prepared. I kind of got in through a, a not really a loophole, but like I got through an easier route because I was a mature age student because I was over 21. I I then just sat a test that I scored really well in because my intelligence was good, not because my study was good or anything like that. So I got into university. I had zero study skills. I had really bad study habits. I had like, I was not able to write assignments. I was not able to, like I really, for the first six months or first semester to the first year, I struggled. I got a lot of, a lot of like ones and twos out of, out of seven. We, we score in Australia. I got a lot of ones and twos. I, I got good grades in, in some as well, which, which, but all the challenging subjects really low because I, I wasn't ready. I wasn't, I hadn't proved, I hadn't developed the skills so I couldn't get in. So my question to you there is, it was great that I had an opportunity because I wouldn't have gotten it other way, you know, because of my disabilities or, or whatever it may be. So, okay, so I was disadvantaged, but I also wasn't prepared. And so how do you, how do you balance that by, well, we'll just let these people in because they're disadvantaged. How do we make sure, because it's kind of unfair on them that we're then lumping them in to this high performance, you know, high pressure situation. How do we make sure that they can handle that if we're just setting the bar lower for them? Well, look, I think one of the responsibilities of the university is to actually provide assistance and uh, I don't know what the situation is like in the United States, but here in Australia, the universities do provide a lot of assistance. But of course, it's up to the student to take advantage of, of the assistance which is made available. My observation, yeah. this will sound harsh, there's easily 30% of students in universities here in this country, in Australia, they shouldn't be there. Mm. Yep. They're just not wired for university work. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's a terrible tragedy, actually, that we're really making people think they must go to university. No, they yeah, mustn't. Yeah, that's good. There's, yeah. there's no must about it. Yeah. Um, he, here in Australia, we've got a shortage of people in the trades. Mm-hmm. Now, if, if we're convincing everybody that doing anything other than going to university after you leave school is a bad thing, of course, people are not going to be attracted to go into the trades. Yep. And so we've got a shortage of people in the trades. We, 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 we tell everybody that university graduates are going to make more income over their lifetime than those who don't have a university degree. But that's not true. And look, <laughs> though, well, it's becoming less and less true, that's for sure, as more mm. and more people graduate. As, mm. a, you know, as a higher proportion of the population have university degrees, the university degree just becomes a gateway Yep. Um, you know, you've got to ha- wave that degree in front of somebody before you can get a job, but it doesn't necessarily help you in, in that job. And the, the worry that if you don't have a university degree, you won't earn a high income, it's just an absolute, um, it, it, I think it's it's a lie yep. because you don't have to live by the averages. Mm-hmm. And I know for sure and certain that somebody who goes into the trades, as long as they don't drink their, their income away, they mm-hmm. can actually build a very significant wealth portfolio. Or buy too many want jet to. skis with their... Yeah. Absolutely. Well, they can be off the tools <laughs> by the time they're 40. Yeah. Uh, and, if, and if you don't believe it, someone come and talk to me about it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I let, it, yeah, it's I, look, possible. I'm a bit of an advocate so, for this because I used to, uh, when I first started business coaching, yeah, I specialised yeah. with, with... Yes, you did. That's trades, right. That's right. Absolutely. You know, and so Absolutely. working with yep. them, yep. helping them actually... You know, be smarter with their businesses and it was so yeah. it was such such a reward because yeah look trust me yeah. trades can make really good money have a really good can. business and yeah so sorry i digress yeah. so look so one issue there are too many people in universities that's it's not politically correct to say that there's no doubt that that's that is the case the second thing is some people do enter university without appropriate study skills i was one of them yeah. I succeeded in high school. I was very successful 
academically in high school, but I found it very difficult to adjust the way I thought and wrote when I entered university, and I did quite poorly. I think I only failed one subject. Back in those days, subjects were year long, by the way, so I failed one of my subjects in the mid-year exams, and I really only just scraped through in many others, and it took me a long time to figure out that learning at university level was was really quite different mm. because it required a different way of thinking. It required a, a a more mature way of thinking, a deeper learning. To put to put it, I guess uh, in simple terms, it was to make the transition from learning what to understanding why. Yes. And yep. I, I struggled. I really struggled with that transition. And I did get some help. I did go along to our to the learning and teaching seminars and so on. I learned all sorts of study techniques and so on. And eventually it did click and I ended up graduating with a first class honours degree. Mm-hmm. But I didn't start out so well. And that's yep. one of the reasons why I'm so strongly committed to the idea that it's the it's the end that matters, not so much the beginning. Yeah, and uh, right. frankly, I'd, I'd like to see st- pretty much open entry into universities, but on the understanding that there will be quite a severe culling process. Now, also culturally, and, and this is an issue of leadership for, for people who are in the university system, culturally, I think we've got to go get away from the idea that if you fail, that you're a failure. Mm-hmm. No, and yes. I used to say this to my students, you're not a failure. You've discovered that this isn't for you. Yes. So, yeah, you know, it, when I was a business academic, sorry to talk over you, but when I was a business right. academic, I, I, occasionally I'd come across a student who was lousy at business. Mm-hmm. And I, I would say, well, okay, you've discovered that business isn't for you. This is not your calling. Have a think. Let's see if we can work out what your calling might be. And so I had students yep. who shifted for example, into education or into one of the social sciences, uh, other social sciences areas, and, and, and they succeeded. Mm. So sometimes, you know, we've, we've got to allow people to fail without labeling, labeling them as failures, but That's rather really they've good. actually discovered that something just isn't for them. Rock well, climbing that... isn't for me. I tried <laughs> and I failed. <laughs> yeah. I don't see isn't myself it... as a failure. <laughs> yeah, isn't I mean, and isn't that the 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 purpose of our youth anyway? We're meant to be discovering things and trying oh, to absolutely. figure out yeah. what we're good at, what we're not. Like if I I've been through a lot of different careers and a lot of different things, every single one of them has added to my experience, has enabled me, has kind of, if you look back on it, it's beautiful patchwork of of preparing me for what I do now. But I'd do one thing, I'd succeed at it and move on because I was bored, or I'd fail at it and take my lessons and move on. And I think that, that that's that's actually a very, very good lesson is, is the fact that yeah, just because we we fail at something doesn't mean that we're a failure. I love it because we should be discovering what is our purpose. I mean, not everyone's purpose is university. Not everyone's purpose is the same thing. We, we, you know, this is the the core of what we what we teach around it. Everyone we you know in the Bible it talks about you know Paul writes about with one body many parts. The ear can't wish that it was a nose, otherwise the body wouldn't be able to hear. You know, like, so So we all have a different part to play. We can't all play that exact same part as everyone else. So we don't have to be sheep and follow everything. If something doesn't work for us, that's okay. It was a, it was a learning. It was a, you know, it was a lesson, you know, not a loss and we can learn from it and, and move on. You know, it, it, it was a failure. It, we failed at it, but we're not a failure. I think that's uh, that's really good. But also, Dr. Rod, just want to kind of look at this from, actually, before 
If you guys want any, like if you're wondering about what's this affirmative action administration thing, I've put a link below to um, to uh, a Wall Street Journal video that I thought was actually quite well put down, put down that really explained the the whole you know, affirmative action admissions kind of process and the different different takes on everything like that. I, I thought it was actually a quite informative um, uh, a yeah, video, which was really good. Now, oh, there's so much, so much that you just said, Dr. Rod, that I want to kind of jump on because you even shifted my thoughts on this because I'm very much believing. Okay, let, I'm going to step back for a moment. You're probably thinking you're, you're, um, you may have, um, you may have, uh, Let, let me get my thoughts. You 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 mentioned that we're talking about we're talking about university, and you probably think I don't go to university, I don't want to go to university, I don't run a university, whatever. Okay, so let's talk about our businesses and the way that we run our businesses or whatever organization we lead. There's that we're going to be pressured with this affirmative action stuff, right? And and we we have to, and and like you said. There is an advantage to it, and there's a disadvantage to it, and there's you know the, 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 there's different approaches. So I want to kind of I want to talk about the way that this is approached, but I want everyone to kind of consider also in the back of their mind this isn't about university admissions. This is how you're running your business, how you're running your teams, how are you leading in life. My initial reaction was. Because in the Wall Street Journal video, they were actually talking about um, uh, that someone sued because they they had they had better scores. They didn't have no, good enough scores to get into the university in the the main section. But if they compared themselves with with the other people that that were the affirmative action you know recruits they did better than them. So they, you know, they sued and they got into university and everything like that because there's discrimination and all that sort of stuff. So you know, Wall Street, the Wall Street Journal video talks about this. It's really good. And that was my, I must admit, that was my original take on it. I'm like, yeah, of course. Like, like it should just be whoever performs the best should you know, get in. Like that, that's it. Cut and dry. You, no one should look at race, at color, or like whatever. It's here's the results. However, in this video, they do actually talk about the comparison between uh, California that that took it that that changed their affirmative action, that removed affirmative action ten years ago or twenty years ago, whatever it was that they said, and they're seeing that there's actually a massive decrease in in um, in minorities and, and and all that sort of stuff and like this is actually one of the graphs that they that they show about you know the difference between before um, affirmative action and afterwards and and you know the representation of of minorities and and stuff like that. Go and watch the video. Like go and watch the video. Um, so so m my take was originally. Yeah, look, should just be on performance and that's it. However, you did what you mentioned was like there's some people that are disadvantaged, everything. And I thought to myself, when I was at university, there were affirmative action admissions for Aboriginals, right? Like they, you know, it was always spoken about that they could just get into university, everything like that. But at university, I kind of never cared that they were there because I didn't feel like I was missing out because they were there. I'm like, good on them, whatever. Like it, it just didn't bother me. However, when you started speaking about it earlier, it did kind of, my mind started going, oh, maybe there is an advantage to it. Maybe there is a place for it. It shouldn't just be performance. We should set aside like, 5%, 10%, whatever for disadvantaged people. And I'm not missing out because of that 10% because that 10% is set aside anyway. So it's only out of 90% that I've got an opportunity for anyway. It's not, you know, that, that's, that is permanently set aside. So 
I do kind of get that. And being someone who has learning disabilities and took it, like you mentioned before about the universities have all the, you know, the, the opportunities for people with, with, you know, with, with challenges. And, and I did, I took advantage of every, probably took too much advantage of some of them, to be honest. Um, I feel like you've kind of changed my mind a little bit on this, but how can we as leaders make sure that we are being fair, giving opportunity to people of l- lesser opportunity and 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 not lesser people, but you know, like people that that are disadvantaged? How do we give? How do we as leaders? make sure that we are still performing. Like we, we've got our organizations, our teams, everything, we have to perform best, right? We So we need the best team and everything like that. And sometimes affirmative hires are not quite the best, but it's, you know, the best of the other bunch or whatever. But how do we balance that as leaders? Yeah, look, I, I think we've got to be very careful about, uh, if you like, carrying this particular Supreme Court decision into the environment of individual businesses. Mm -hmm. If we're running a business, we need to ensure that that business is sustainable. And by that, I mean that the business will still be here one year, three years, five years, 10 years from now. So it is very important that you hire the best person for whatever position you have. However, And I don't think this works in very small businesses. So you you need, I think, probably, Mm. look, it's an arbitrary figure, but you probably need to have at least 50 employees for this to work. But once you get to a a reasonable size where you have, say, around maybe somewhere between 40 and 50 employees, then I do think you're able to have a couple of experimental positions in your business. Mm -hmm. In other words... If people fail in those positions or those positions fail in terms of the structure of your organisation, they're not going to pull it down. This can't work in a very small business. But in a larger business, I think you are able to do some experimentation and bring people in who may not have the right qualifications or experience or even personal attributes. So they wouldn't be the, if you like, the normal hires. And then uh, invest in. I think this is a Christian thing to do. Now, I'm not an advocate of DEI, uh, diversity, um, equity, equity and, uh, and, and but, inclusion. Yes. I don't believe in these externally um, um, administered or these ex- the, these things being forced on businesses. It should never be legislated. I I don't even think it should be something that the peak bodies. Um, advocate or impose on their members. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that many of the people that we're speaking to are Christians and they have a desire to lead in a Christian way. If they own or, or have a senior management role in a business, they want to be business owners or business managers in a Christian way. What I'm suggesting is that the Christian way is to allow for a few positions in your business, in a sense, to be experimental and to appoint people into those positions who may, in fact, be otherwise unemployable or who, in the normal course of events, may not have an opportunity to embark, say, on a management track within a business. And I think we need to have a kind of contract as well where it's made quite clear that this is the nature of the position and what we're trying to achieve with it. Mm. Again, the emphasis, I think, should be on what the outcome is, not on what the input is. As I say, this is not going to work for small businesses because the risk that it goes wrong has very significant implications for the business. Your primary responsibility as a business manager or as an owner is to ensure that that business actually survives and continues to um, contribute positively to human flourishing by yeah. placing good products on the market and offering good jobs for people. Yeah, so I hope I'm not forward. misunderstood. I no. definitely mm. don't support 
DEI, we shouldn't be imposing these things. But if, if you're in business, I think you should give serious consideration to the suggestion that I've made. Hey, that was an excerpt from our On The Cube Leadership Podcast. If you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up, put a comment below. And if you want to see more content like this, faith-based leadership development content, make sure you check out our channel, give it a subscribe, and hit the bell notification so that you'll be notified when we release new content. Thank you.